Professor Jones, uh, does the EU have an incentive to make Brexit hard or soft? Well, I think the EU has an incentive to, to build a stable relationship with the United Kingdom after this exit takes place. That said, it also has an incentive to make sure that other countries don't follow in the United Kingdom's model. So, hard, soft, I, I think they're going to make it fairly difficult for the United Kingdom to have its cake and eat it too, which is what the May government seems to want. And in that sense, the hard Brexit that Britain has just announced will be matched by an equally hard diplomatic negotiating response. Professor Matisse, does the EU have an incentive to make Brexit hard or soft? That's a classic Goldilocks problem that the European Union faces, right? They can't make it too easy or they can't get too hot with the UK because that sets the precedent for other countries that may be thinking of leaving in the future. On the other hand, do they make it too hard? Do they go too cold on Britain? That could have significant consequences for the European economy as well as the British economy. So that's not in their interest either. So they need to find that kind of perfect balance, which I think will be a very hard thing to do. What lessons will Eurosceptic parties in France or Eastern Europe draw from the Brexit vote? Well, I think what Eurosceptic parties are going to draw from this vote is that there's a groundswell of popular support that is ready to be mobilized. Much of that popular support is not being captured in public opinion polling data. So they will look for the keys that they can find to mobilize their own voters not necessarily in the same kind of a contest and in or out vote on whether to remain a member of the European Union, but in other contests, both political for elections and referendum to demonstrate their displeasure with the ruling elite. I think they will be very much encouraged by this vote because it is in many ways a kind of anti-elitist, anti-Brussels revolt which is grist to their mill. There is a big difference, however, between Euro members and non-Euro members, because I think there's still no desire for Euro members to leave the Euro, it would be too complicated. But for countries not in the Eurozone, I think they will very much look at how this goes and see whether they can follow uh, the Brexit example. To what extent will London lose ground as the financial capital of Europe to other European cities? I think with the referendum vote, London has already begun to lose ground relative to its own historic past. The high state of London as the financial capital of Europe has been passed. That doesn't mean that we're going to see another financial capital emerge. I think it's much more likely that what will happen is different sorts of financial activity move to different parts of the European Union without a single concentration of activity forming like we had in London before the referendum. I also think London will remain relatively prominent, if not the most prominent center for financial activity in the future. It's just that, that a lot of what was in London will be elsewhere. That's a tough question because a lot of London's business is also hedge funds and currencies and I think that, that won't go away. But when it comes to European business, they stand to lose a lot if they lose this, what's called the single passport and access to the single market. So I think this will benefit countries like Ireland or the Netherlands and even Germany and France, where I think significant parts of businesses, of financial business, will be relocated to. So I think it will have an impact on the city in the medium to long term.